Never Been Middle Class, which is the title of a book by Hattis Weiss, who will be in the discussion, uh, along with Gary Roth, Gabriel Winant, and uh, Kyle Kubler. Uh, on Monday at uh, 5 p.m., uh, Resource Radicals, uh, which is a new book by Theoria Francos uh, on the pink tide in Latin America, which uh, uh, essentially uh, buoyed, it, buoyed itself on this, uh, this tide of uh, funds from extractive industries. And uh, she offers a balance sheet as to how they did and what sort of problems and contradictions that entailed. Uh, she'll be talking with uh, Vanessa Frege. Uh, on uh, Tuesday at 2 p.m., uh, Set the Night on Fire, uh, which is the name of a new book by Mike Davis and John Wiener about LA in the 60s. Uh, and uh, Magali Miranda Alcazar will be the uh, moderator for that one. Uh, so lots of good stuff coming up. Uh, check the calendar, www.redmayseattle.org. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we need money, not as much as uh, one would think for a festival, but a little bit. Uh, and if you like what you see and uh, would like to see more, not only this year, but next year, uh, go down to the description box in YouTube. You'll see a little donate button. Click on that. And uh, we depend on the kindness of strangers. So uh, whatever you feel uh, capable of giving, we will lovingly accept it. Uh, so onward we go to the future of negative solidarity. Uh, I would like to introduce you now to our host today, uh, critic and writer Bruno George. Thanks, Philip. Okay, so today we're talking about negative solidarity. You might think of negative solidarity as an inverted social bond or anti bond in which I accept my bad lot in life as the price of enjoying the spectacle of your equally bad lot. If solidarity is social cohesion based on sympathy or shared interests or mutual cooperation, whose motto might be, we're all in this together, then negative solidarity is an inverted form, an anti-bond whose motto might be, sucks to be you. Now, the king or Donald Trump can also say, sucks to be you. But then it isn't negative solidarity when it's said from a great height, from a great differential of wealth and power. Negative solidarity means I'm willing to suffer myself in order to enjoy the sight of your suffering. And in the US, negative solidarity plays out along racial and gendered lines. In 1969, speaking of a black, brown, or black Latinx alliance, the Black Panther Fred Hampton said, we're not gonna fight racism with racism. We're gonna fight with solidarity. Solidarity for Hampton was the name of acting in common across differences. Negative solidarity might be another name for what W.E.B. Du Bois called the wages of whiteness, the sop of cruel enjoyment offered to poor whites in the reconstruction South. If whites had a raw deal, they could take solace in their position of social and material superiority to even poorer black workers. And today during the pandemic, I think it's possible that we're seeing a stimulus package for the wages of whiteness, a kind of affective bonus. And I'd just like to end these introductory remarks uh, with a glance at this image. If I can share this. Green, is that working? No way. Eh? Um, yeah, can you see that photo? Got okay. So um, this just points to the timeliness of discussing negative solidarity now in a time when people are fighting in manipulated specular protests for the right to die at work. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, uh, 
First is Jason Reed. He's professor of philosophy at the University of Southern Maine. He's the author of The Micropolitics of Capital, Marx and the Prehistory of the Present, and The Politics of Trans Individuality, and a forthcoming collection of essays, The Production of Subjectivity Between Marxism and Post-Structuralism. Blogs on popular culture, philosophy, and politics at unemployednegativity.com. Jeremy Gilbert is Professor of Cultural and Political Theory at the University of East London. His most recent publication is the book um, Common Ground, Democracy and Collectivity in an Age of Individualism, and also the book 21st Century Socialism. He's currently working on two other books, Hegemony Now and The Last Days of Neoliberalism. Joe Isaacson is a professor of English at Modesto Junior College and a founding editor of Blind Field Journal. She's the author of The Ballerina and the Bull, Anarchist Utopias in the Age of Finance. Um, for the past five years, her work has focused on political themes in horror films. And finally, Stephen Shaviro is the DeRoy Professor of English at Wayne State University in Detroit. These days he writes mostly about science fiction, music videos, and the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead. So we'll start with Jason. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so uh, I'm gonna read the, a paper which is uh, kind of gonna, I guess, be the starting off point. Um, and it's, despite what is said, this is kind of a pre-COVID PC, as they say, kind of reflections, although hopefully it'll pave the way for a discussion of how these uh, affects and their imaginations have mutated in the COVID uh, era. So uh, the title of this paper is Negative Solidarity, the Effective Economy and Neoliberalism's Decline. Spinoza's question of political thought, why do the masses fight for their servitude as if it was salvation? has taken on an unanticipated economic and social relevance since the post-2008 economic recession. Displaced from its 17th century context of taxes and bread, wars of glory and despots, it is possible to see a struggle for servitude in the way in which the masses clamor for more jobs, more austerity, and more persecution of the disadvantaged in the name of fiscal discipline. In a post on the blog Splintering, blog, uh, Splintering Bone Ashes, Alex Williams has dubbed this particular struggle for servitude negative solidarity. Negative solidarity is defined as, quote, an aggressively enraged sense of injustice committed to the idea that because I must endure increasing austere working conditions, wage freezes, loss of benefits, declining pension funds, ratio of job security, and increasing precarity, then everyone else must too, end quote. We can point to perhaps multiple instances of negative solidarity and with them a changing trajectory of both imagination and affect as its meaning, which is to say its objects and narratives shift. There is the iconic figure of the welfare queen and with it the entire racialized demonization of benefit programs for the unemployed and impoverished. There is also the figure of the migrant, also chastised for dependency and laziness on the one hand and sometimes as stealing jobs on the other. More recently, negative solidarity has been aimed at the public service worker, the teacher or government employee who still benefits, albeit ever so slightly, from union protection and collective bargaining. Uh, and is thus seen as failing to suffer or work adequately. That negative solidarity can take on so many different figures, many of which are pure fantasies disconnected from reality suggests that it is at its core an articulation of imagination and affect. Articulating and elaborating a definition of negative solidarity entails a necessary detour through the effective economy. The effective economy is understood first uh, in, is understood in two senses. First, in that the economy, the relations of production and distribution, circulation, uh, circulation produce affects, sensibilities and desires as much as goods and services. And second, these affects are a necessary element of the production and reproduction of the economy. Sorry. So first, a definition of effective economy. According to Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, 
Spinoza did not just pose the question of negative solidarity of why people fight for their servitude as if it was salvation, but offer the basis of an answer to it as well. In order to grasp how, as Dilzantari put it, desire of the most disadvantaged creature will invest with all of its strength, irrespective of any economic understanding or lack of it, the capitalist social field as a whole, it is necessary to think the imminence of desire to the economy. Desire must be posited as part of the infrastructure without passing through the mediations of ideology, the family, or the state. Deleuze and Guattari's provocation exceeds their own particular articulation in Anti-Oedipus to become a general problem of contemporary Marxist thought. There's a general turn towards understanding subjectivity to be not only directly produced by the economy without passing through the mediations of the superstructure, but reproductive it as, of it as well, to be a necessary condition of the reproduction of society. This insight is found not only in Deleuze and Guattari's work, but in Althusser's re-examination of ideology and reproduction, as well as the work of neo-Spinozas such as Frédéric Lordon and Yves Citon. The causes of this change, no doubt, are no doubt complex and numerous, have as much to do with the changing nature of capitalism itself as they do with the history of worker and student struggle. As capital requires work that is more intensive, cooperative, and relational, it needs a subject that's not only docile and compliant, showing up for work each day, but actively desires to be put to work, fully identifying with his or her work and place in the economy. Spinoza's identity of bodies and ideas makes it possible to grasp an economy that is increasingly predicated on the identity of economy and subjectivity. How does Spinoza, a philosopher from the 17th century, make it possible to grasp this rather recent transformation First, there is Spinoza's definition of subjectivity, of the human essence as defined by desire. As Spinoza writes, desire is the very essence of man insofar as his essence is conceived as determined to any action from any given affection of itself. As much as Spinoza's definition posits a universal essence, it does so in a way that is both singular, we all have different desires depending on our particular constitution, and relational in that our constitutions are the effects of our encounters and relations with others. Put differently, desire is trans-individual. Desires are necessary, different and unique, determined by the affections. Everyone desires according to their own unique history. As Spinoza argues, we do not desire something because it is good. There is no telos for desire. Rather, quote, we judge something to be good because we strive for it, will it, want it, and desire it. End of quote. Desire is fundamentally intransitive, lacking a specific object or orientation. Its objects and orientations are determined by the history of relations. Everyone strives to increase their joy, their capacity to act and think, but how this joy is defined is in part determined by the history of past encounters. I desire those things that seem to me to be the cause of past joys, even if I'm ignorant of the true causes of my desires or true effects of my attachments. Everyone equally strives, but not all striving is equal. The Kanadas striving is always caught between two determinations. There's the past history of encounters that assigns a given individual specific objects and desires without adequately grasping their relations and the possibility of a life oriented from an adequate comprehension of its conditions and an increase of its joy. It is this ethical division between the passive and the active that animates Spinoza's thought. It is, as Andre Tossel argues, an ethical materialism, a materialism oriented in terms of the division and difference of modes of individuation considered primarily in terms of their individual biographical relations that takes this terrain of inquiry, affects desire and imagination as constitutive of subjectivity. Frederick Lordon argues that Spinoza's mode of subjection can be expanded beyond the ethical distinction of modes of life to the history of the production and reproduction of subjectivity under capitalism. Doing so entails expanding the encounters that shapes one's desires from the biographical to the structural. Spinoza provides something of an opening of this transition from the ethical to the social when he writes that money occupies the mind of the multitude more than anything else. Money is the universal equivalent of desire, not just because of past positive experiences in one's biography, but an institutional one, because we live in a market society in which money is the condition of any desire. Lordon is then able to map the coordinates of the institution of desire into two axes. The first is considered in terms of the division between production and consumption, the two separate spheres of activity in capitalist society. Production and consumption relate to the two structural conditions of capitalism, 
wage labor and the commodity form, but they also form the basis of different organizations of desire, of joy and sadness. The second axis drawn from Spinoza is that of joy or sadness understood as an increase or decrease in one's power and potential. From these two axes, it is possible to chart the history of desire under capitalism. The first phase of this history corresponds to the initial formation of capitalism, what Marx called formal subsumption. The primary institutional basis for capitalism at this stage is the absence of any alternative to wage labor, the destruction of the commons or any sustenance economy. Activity, the ac necessary activity that sustains life is organized and oriented according to wage labor. The passion to be reckoned with, to borrow the phrase from Hobbes, at this stage of capital is fear. Uh, fear is the idea of a future hardship or sadness. Fear is a motive, a driving force orienting the striving, the canatus, but an unstable one. People compelled by fear will work, but only as much as it is necessary to stave off punishment or losing their job. Those who do not work do not eat, and it is a fear of starvation or homelessness that keeps one working. Fear is not only a limited incentive, it is also a fundamentally unstable one. Fear can drive one to revolt as much as it can compel one to obey. From this then, Lord on maps a second stage that roughly corresponds with Fordism and the rise of consumer society. For Lordon, the institutional effect of Fordism is one of the destruction of the pleasures and pride of concrete labor, the pleasures of a particular skill, in favor of a general shift of desire away from labor towards consumption. Ford's $5 day establishes an effective economy, exchanging sadness and frustration at work for the pleasures of the newly emergent consumer society. The final, or at least most recent change in this effective economy reorients pleasures towards work, but it's no longer the pleasure of particular skill or result, but is the pleasure of employment itself. It is desire that as much as possible modeled on abstract labor. The modern subject of capitalism, capitalism is described by terms that are stripped of any or reference to any particular task or activity and instead refer to employability as a general idea. The modern individual is a professional entrepreneur of him or herself. Formal subsumption, Fordism, neoliberalism constitute the rough schema of the history of the canatus of desire to capitalism. It is a history that moves from the negative affects to the positive, from fear to joy, from consumption to production, a transition that is less a liberation, freedom from fear and want, than a subjection. It culminates in the modern ideal to find one's realization, one's passion, in the structure and activity in work itself. The new mantra is do what you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. But in practice, this is less about the revalorization of a trade or the pleasures of specific concrete labor than finding a passion for the constant mobilization of one's potential. Professional no longer refers to a set of skills or knowledge, but a particular subjective comportment of engaged attachment. It is a history in which the gap between the capitalist interest and the striving of the worker shrinks to become barely perceptible, a world of motivated self-starters. Uh, second part, negative solidarity. With the provisional structure of the effective economy outlined here, it is possible then to try to map out a later stage beyond Lordon's sketch of neoliberalism, something that comes after the effective economy of neoliberal motivation. Jennifer Silva, in coming up short, working class adulthood in an age of uncertainty, outlines some directions of the effective economy and what could be called late neoliberalism. Silva sets out to examine precisely what happens to lives in the US caught in the post 2008 recession. These are the lives of primarily working class people caught up in debt with dwindling job prospects and often living with their parents. They have been denied the promised life of, career, of families, careers and homes of their own, mourning the slow decline of the Fordist dream. What Silva finds striking is a lack of any anger or political mobilization on the part of those who are left out of this dream. Being left out of the dream of a steady and linear career does not entirely exclude one from the mythology, the ideal of work and discipline. As Silva describes her general findings, quote, at its core, this emerging working class adult self is characterized by low expectations of work, <laughs> 
wariness towards romantic commitment, widespread distrust of social institutions, profound isolation from others, and an overriding focus on their emotions and psychic health. Rather than turn to politics to address the obstacles standing in the way of a secure adult life, the majority of the men and women I interview crafted deeply personal coming of age stories, grounding their adult identities in recovering from their painful past, whether it addiction, child abuse, family trauma, or abandonment, and forging an emancipated, transformed, and adult self. End of quote. To describe this shift along the lines outlined by Lordon, we can see a new affective orientation, one sustained neither by consumption, which is too limited, reduced to basic necessities to capture desire, or even production as work becomes stripped of not only any joys, but any fantasy of mobility and accumulation. The failures of consumption or wage labor to offer any joy does not lead to their rejection or to a critical attitude towards capitalism. What emerges instead is an ideal of work as discipline, Self-transformation -trans becomes a source of validation. Personal worth is found not through what one can buy or even what one can sell of oneself, but in the sense of self-transformation or responsibility for one's own condition. It is a responsibility that matters, not the results or outcome. The focus on self-responsibility, of taking responsibility for overcoming all of one's hardships and traumas entails a massive distrust of any collective or institutional solution and a corresponding suspicion for those who engage in them. Pride in taking responsibility in one's fate is an attempt to construct a joy, a positive condition out of a negative sad affect. It is an attempt to make the difficulty of changing or altering one's condition itself into a source of pride or joy. Spinoza argues the mind has a tendency to dwell on things that increase its joy or power. Lord Don, in turn, argues that the effect of this is less some innate tendency towards affirmation or liberation than an explanation of how people can put up with most limited possibilities for joy and power. It is less a line of flight than what keeps us confined in whatever situation we find ourselves in. The tendency to affirm joy leads to individuals to dwell on those tiny pleasures of workday, the small talk and casual Fridays, or in this case, the satisfaction and sense of responsibility that stems from relying only on oneself. As the possibility for aspiring for more, for systemic change is increasingly reduced, the tiny pleasures of daily life are elevated into objects of desire. As Lordon describes this double-edged movement, quote, symbolic violence consists then properly speaking in the production of a double imaginary. The imaginary fulfillment, which makes the humble joys assigned to the dominated appear sufficient, and the imaginary of powerlessness, which convinces them to renounce any greater ones to which they may aspire. End of quote. If the fulfillment that comes from the small pleasure of the workday or work itself seen as a source of pride, then the imaginary of powerlessness comes not just from the contemporary labor situation, increasingly subject to rule of capital and prof profitability, but the overall sense of reduced possibility and resources that permeate social life. This increased sense of austerity comes from declining wages, which are, which are coupled with a dwindling tax base. As Monica Potts describes the attitudes in Arkansas in a recent uh, New York Times profile, quote, there's a prevailing sense of scarcity. It is easy for people who have lived much of their lives in a place where $25 an hour seems like a high salary to believe that there just isn't enough money to go around. The government here and elsewhere just can't afford to help anyone, people told me. This attitude extends to national issues like immigration, where I see new needless cruelty, my neighbors see necessary reality, end of quote. This, the prevailing sense of this austerity is one in which an individual's own difficulty in paying their bills, their, increase, their own increased debt, is projected outward into a world in which scarcity is the rule and generosity, even equity or justice, is a kind of luxury. That this scarcity is artificial, produced in a, con in a context of ever-increasing wealth for the wealthiest 1%, or pocketing the product of declining wages and massive tax cuts, does not matter. What matters is the increasing perception, the image of limited resources and limited possibilities. These limitations, this imaginary powerlessness is internalized as a valorization of one's toughness, hardness, and discipline. These become the only joys left. 
It is possible to understand such a subject as the rugged individual posited against society, and that's often how it is presented. The claim of being an individual free from collective influence or belonging is as important as being seen as responsible. Such claims cannot be taken at face value. The prevalence of the same attitudes and ideas, the claim from so many disparate and different people to be an individual first and foremost, would seem to negate its enunciation. Such an individual such an individuation is trans-individual, even if this trans-individuation takes on the paradoxical status of a, a refusal of any collective relation or belonging. Thus, it could be argued that there is a negative individuality as a necessary corollary of negative solidarity. This individuality is not only negative in its refusal of any collective belonging, but ultimately in its terms of individuation as well the very conditions that undermine collective belonging, the persistent sense of precarity and inability to construct a coherent trajectory also undermine the conditions of individuation. The destruction of individuation through labor is augmented by the rise of consumer society, which as much as it promises a world of freedom, equality and Bentham has turned out to be actually be a world of manufactured desires and digital surveillance. The negative solidarity that manifests itself as a kind of free floating anger and frustration has as its corollary and condition individuals tossed and turned by the conflicts of, of affects in the imagination without an ability to orient thought or to act. The sketch of a neoliberal or a post neoliberal subject is a highly ambivalent one. Its ambivalence stems from the ambivalence of the affects, a tendency for every positive affect, joy or hope or love to be shadowed by its opposite and risk becoming it. In this case, joys and pleasures are not only inseparable from pains and tribulations, but are a kind of transformation or revalorization of them. The pride of work is a transformation of pain into pleasure, of difficulty into responsibility. It also reveals the connection between striving and the imagination. The attachments to, to responsibility, to a sense of worth found in work are strategies for coping with declining prospects for improved material conditions, for the pleasures of consumer society. They are remnants, often images of bygone conditions and decaying dreams. What we increasingly see in austerity is a revival of the oldest myth and legends of capital and capitalist accumulation against this material reality. It is the revival of primitive accumulation, not in the sense of the violence of expropriation against the commons, but in the sense of the narrative of so-called primitive accumulation, the story of the frugal capitalist and lazy worker that provides a moral veneer to the capitalist relations. As Marx writes, quote, the long quote, this primitive accumulation plays approximately the same role in political economy as original sin does in theology. Adam bit the apple and thereupon sin fell on the human race. Its origin is supposed to be explained when it's told as an anecdote about the past. Long, long ago, there were two sorts of people. One, the diligent, intelligent, and above all frugal elite. The other, lazy rascals spending their substance and more in riotous living. The legend of the theological original sin tells us certainly how man came to be condemned to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow. But the history of economic original sin reveals to us that there the, there are people to whom this is by no means essential. Never mind. Thus it came to pass the former sort accumulated wealth and the latter sort finally had nothing to sell but their own skins." End of quote. Primitive accumulation persists not as a myth about the origins of capital, but as a lingering morality play about the present. Work, especially work that is understood as real, which is to say coded as productivist, masculine and often white is understood to be the source of at least symbolic value, even as its market value declines. As the Bible says, those who do not work should not eat. In this case, not because their work is necessary for survival of the community, but because it's necessary to make them worthy. Moreover, all those who are not sufficiently engaged in the productivist ideal, teachers, caregivers, bureaucrats, are seen as not really working or to use the parlance of our times, they do not have a real job. They are suspect as well. The narrative of the heart of primitive accumulation was always defined by temporal displacement. It was an idealized version of the present, the hard worker who saves enough to become a capitalist, projected onto the past, onto capital's origins. Now it is projected into the future. The moral ideal of hard work outlasts his material compensation. What connects the past and the present, the fantasy of survival and the morality of work, 
is an increasing sense of scarcity in the virtues of difficulty. The story about, story about the moral value of work is all that remains as work is increasingly subject to the logics of casualization and precarity. It is at this point that it's Spinoza's understanding of the constitution of ideas of the mind as a spiritual automaton that is as important to grasping the contemporary sense of work than his understanding of the, of the organization of desire. It is much a matter of inadequate ideas as it is the reorganization of desire. Just as, as our, our desire is oriented by our encounters and our effects, our mind, our thinking is a sort of spiritual automaton shaped by its encounters and relations. As Spinoza argues, so-called universal notions such as man, dog, etc., stem as much from a confusion as any comprehension. They are inadequate ideas unable to grasp or comprehend their genesis. As Spinoza describes this process, quote, but it should be noted that these notions are not formed by all in the same way, but vary from one to another in accordance with what the body has more often been affected by and what the mind imagines or recollects more easily. For example, those who have more often regarded man's stature with wonder will understand by the word man, an animal of erect stature. But those who have been accustomed to consider something else will form another common image of men. For example, that man is an animal capable of laughter or a featherless biped or a rational animal. And similarly concerning the others, each will form universal images of, a, of things according to the disposition of his body. Hence, it is not surprising that so many controversies have arisen among the philosophers who have often wished to explain natural things by mere image of things, end quote. Work, labor, or productivity are said in many senses. There's a general physical notion of energy expended and displacement and transformation, the economic sense of activity, any activity done for a wage, the more diffuse sense in which any activity defined by effort and difficulty is dubbed work, homework, housework, etc. And lastly, there's a moral ideal of discipline and value that is attached to the last two meanings. These different senses do not only, as the passage from Spinoza indicates, stem from different encounters and relations in which everyone had their own personal idiosyncratic definition, but there is in every society an attempt to impose and standardize one particular definition, imposing its particular sense on all the others. There's a dominant sense of work, a dominant meaning, as much as there's a dominant effective constitution of labor. The dominant sense and sense of work is a motley collection of everything that's ever been believed, made up of remnants of Puritan struggle, Fordist promises, and contemporary anxieties, and its anachronisms are tailored to the current conjuncture in which more is demanded of employees and less is offered and exchange. Okay. Part three, effective economy, mythic economy. From this provisional sketch of the present, it's possible to not only bring effective economy into the present, theorizing a fourth period or late neoliberalism, but in doing so to refine and expand an understanding of what is meant by an effective economy. Turning back to Lardon's conception, it is possible to see two connected limitations. First, Lardon's schema of three periods makes the fundamental error of any period as periodizing periodization, sorry, of history, presenting history as a displacement and transformation of self-contained epochs. Workers driven by fear of losing their, their wages are not totally displaced by Fordist dreams of consumption, just as working to consume has not been displaced by the neoliberal fantasy of being an entrepreneur driven by one's own passionate investment in their work. These different organizations of desire coexist, not just in the same world, distributed across a global economy that combines sweatshops, modern factories, and technology entrepreneurs, often within the same company or producing the same commodity, but also in the same city. And if we consider them in terms of their primary effective dimension, we could say in the same individual. Uh, so we're all driven by both fear, desire to consume and uh, uh, pop a realization of ourselves through work. Moreover, Lourdon's emphasis on a particular affect and particular affect, affective orientation, love or fear aimed towards the activity or towards the wage risks overlooking one of Spinoza's central insights about affects, the ambivalence of affects. Spinoza argues that the human body is, quote, composed of a great many individuals of different natures, end quote. And that when it comes to the objects of desire, to quote again, 
one and the same object can be the cause of many and contrary affects, end of quote. This complexity gives rise to the vacillation of affects. A similar ambivalence traverses the wage relation. Sometimes one works just to pay the bills, and the fear of not being able to do so is what drives one to work. Other times one is motivated by the possibilities of consumption. All of this is topped off, as it were, by the desire to do the work that one loves. These different affective orientations define less three separate epochs in the history of capital than three different affective orientations distributed not only across the same globe, nation, or city, but across the same individual over the course of the working day. This brings us to the second limitation. It is in failing to see the heterogeneity of the effective composition of the present that Lordon fails to recognize that any unity of the present moment, its ability to hold together in the image of a capitalist society, consumer society, or neoliberal gig economy is an effect of the assemblage and organization of ideas and the imagination as much as it is the organization of affects and the striving of bodies. There's a dominant idea or image of work of its uh, reality, value, and affects that organizes the disparate experience and conditions of work. Or more to the point, desires are structured as much by myths and ideals as they are by their material conditions. Our desire, the canatus, is oriented as much by our imagination as by the material conditions that structure labor and consumption. As Spinoza writes, quote, both insofar as the mind has clear and distinct ideas and insofar as it has confused ideas, it strives for an indefinite duration to persevere in its being and is conscious of the striving it has. Which is to say that all acting, all thinking is strategic, as Laurent Bove argues, motivated by an attempt to affirm and maximize its power. As Spinoza writes, the mind, as far as it can, strives to imagine those things that increase or aid the body's power of acting. As Spinoza stresses the indeterminate nature of this striving, those with inadequate ideas uh, and inadequate ideas equally strive, just as striving orients the imagination, compelling us to imagine those things that aid our capacity to action, the imagination conditions and limits striving, determining our sense of what is possible or desirable. Sometimes what we imagine to be the condition of an increase of power, adding or augmenting our power of acting is actually our subjection. Desire and imagination, body and mind, are subject to the same causal relations, the same conditions that make up history. Just as our body is constrained and captured by the wage relation and the commodity that channel our desires, our mind is constrained and captured by the images and narratives of the culture industry. The labor relation cannot be separated from the narratives that we use to make sense of it and orient ourselves. From the Horatio Alger myths of days gone by to the modern day Silicon Valley gurus that extol us to find our true passion and calling. Work is the short circuit between classes, not just in that it's the linchpin of the relation of exploitation of labor power that links the two, as labor power is that what the ruling class needs from the working class and is what the working class must necessarily sell to the capitalists. Uh, at this, the level of material conditions, this exchange both links and divides the two classes. What the capitalist treats as just another commodity and cost of production is for the worker their very life and existence. At the level of representation or imagination, work does not so much divide the classes, placing them on two sides of conflict, but unites them in the image of a common project in universal condition. Work is not just the universal fate of humanity, but the general condition for social belonging. The modern capitalist increasingly presents him or herself as a worker, will insist that he or she works as much as their workers, if not more so. As Etienne Balibar writes, quote, the capitalist is defined as a worker, as an entrepreneur, the worker as the bearer of a capacity of human capital. Thus to offer something of a conclusion, every affective composition, every organization of desires, joys, and sadness is also an imaginary composition and organization of ideas and images. They are but two different ways of viewing the same thing. Any attempt to grasp the economy or society solely through the affects or through the imagination is necessarily incomplete. However, when it comes to political practice, there are strategic reasons for favoring the imagination or the affects or for confronting the image of work. Negative solidarity, like any affective composition, is an articulation of both desire and imagination. And like all such articulations, it is finite and capable of being unraveled. There is nothing necessary about the connection between a moralizing idea of work and pride in one's own hardship as intractic 
impactful as they may appear. Understanding the affective and mythic dimension of the reproduction of the present is the first step in beginning to transform it. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And uh, next we have Jeremy Gilbert. Who is still muted, I think. Yeah, I've unmuted now. Uh, okay, well, great. Well, that's, I mean, uh, that's, I mean, that's great, Jason, as always. Um, and uh, well, I'm just going to make some sort of remarks just to, you know, in response to, um, in response to Jason's paper and, and the analysis, I think that, I mean, I think negative solidarity is a really, it's a really kind of useful concept. So, I mean, I thought I've always thought so. And also I'm sort of thinking about this alongside think, trying to think quite a lot at the moment about, about just solid, the concept of solidarity as such. And I've just finished, um, just finished teaching a, a class um, this term about the idea of solidarity and um, and um, and what it means a sort of positive concept because which, which I would say is like remarkably kind of under theorized actually like what 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 it actually is what we actually mean by it is um, I mean maybe it's because it's maybe it's completely unnecessary to theorize it but um, I go through these I'll make some sort of remarks comments in like in no uh, particular order. I mean, the, f the first thing is, that, the first thing is, is in relation to Laudon actually. It's just, and it's just sort of a question about, about Laudon's reading. And I thought, I thought, I mean, Jason's reading of Laudon, I thought was, I mean, his account was exactly right. And also I sort of agree with the potential problems with Laudon that he, Laudon that he mentions. And I can't, I, I mean, Jason, you've read it, you've gone into it, you've engaged with Laudon much more closely, I mean, I haven't at all really, I've sort of read it a bit, as you know, and got grumpy because he doesn't acknowledge a, a Anglophone affect theory at all, so, um, so and then just like let you deal with it, so, um, but it seemed to me that, that, I mean, it seemed to me in, in Willing Slaves, I mean, he seems to, he seems to depend on really assuming a lot about people's complete internalization of a set of you know, norms and people's sort of participation in a certain kind of a neoliberal culture of work that it seems to me and it seems and it seems to me that it's been one of the one of the typical features of neoliberal culture all the way through and i don't think this i don't think this changes after 2008 that a lot of people's relationship to it is rather one of a sort of cynical distance between um, a set of a set of codes, a set of expectations, which they they recognise the need to defer to. You know, they recognise them as, in some sense, hegemonic, and they have to participate in them. But they don't necessarily, you know, they don't actually believe in them in, in some way. I mean, maybe this. I thought it's really it's really um, interesting to use that Jennifer the the silver book as a source because I guess, I mean, maybe what she's finding in there is that that, that is an over optimistic reading. The people she's talking to, would, you know, seem to be people who have completely. You know they are the subjects Laudon's describing although um but I also I mean the re but the reason I think this is an interesting question is partly because for me I mean one of the sources of negative solidarity and the sort of affects which you know which that name that terms names and the sort of discourses which codify it publicly and codify those affects publicly one of the sources is a, is a kind of is the kind of experience of that cynical gap for people it's that you know is that feeling of having the sense that people feel they they recognize themselves as having to defer to a set of kind of neoliberal practices codes expectations etc that they don't really they don't on some level they don't believe in that they, they don't really actually sort of endorse and that and that can i think also produce a sense of um you know it produces this sense well i i have to knuckle down and get on with it you know why don't other people have to yeah other people should have to um but that's a pretty casual kind of observation i would say at a sort of conceptual level i think it's also worth thinking a bit more about like what of the you know what what is the you know what are, what are the affects that are characteristic of ne negative solidarity and what does it name and for me i think I mean, a really useful idea is that negative solidarity is very closely tied to uh, to resentment and, and resentiment in the classical and the Nietzschean sense. You know, I mean, Nietzsche uses this term resentiment, and that in the Nietzschean literature, it's usually not. I mean, it's usually left in that French word in, as the French word 
to designate it specific philosophical status, then I mean, Nietzsche is obviously always dodgy, like in all kinds of ways. But one of the reasons I think, you know, he's been a useful source for certain thinkers, like several of the people you've referred to, and uh, and is still quite useful, is because this notion of resentment, of resentment as a sort of a, a kind of attachment to a position of weakness, and a kind of you know, and and, and a, a sort of rejection of, and then um, you know. Both anybody, you know, I mean, in Nietzsche, it's sort of a rejection of anybody else's sort of potential for creativity and agency. But it's also, I think, it can be understood as, sort of, as a general rejection of one's own, you know, or the or the, a rejection of the the sense of possibility or potential that might inhere in any kind of collective situation. So I think, and, and I think that notion of resentment, and uh, now as sort of named by Nietzsche, is, is still quite a useful analytical category. And why I think that's useful to sort of think with is because I think resentment is also closely related in that sense is closely related to fear. And I think recognizing this kind of chain or this kind of this set of, you know, very closely related affects of like weakness, fear, etc. Um, as related to, you know, as all kind of uh, very important to this experience of subjection and voluntary servitude, which negative solidarity is part of, is, is kind of analytically useful uh, for a number of reasons. You know, partly, I think, because they sort of, um, <laughs> partly because they, uh, they, they indicate something about what the sort of necessary opposite of those things would be. They, you know, and the, and the extent to which, you know, opposite categories like joy and love are necessarily associated with forms of solidarity and that you know always gives some kind of interesting things to think with and and i think you know and also the, the extent to which you know those the, those things are always connected to some experience or notion of freedom so i think negative solidarity i mean interestingly and, and you sort of allude to this i mean jason i think sort of alludes to this uh, with that notion of um, negative a sort of negative individuation that Negative solidarity is always tied to as well to a sort of negative idea of freedom. I mean, and I, you know, in just it, again, just in the classical sense, it's negative freedom. It's freedom as privation. It's freedom as separation, as opposed to a sort of positive conception of freedom as something potentially expand. You know, something that can be constantly expanded and something that's always collective. Something that's always experienced in a situation of collectivity, which is, you know, necessarily experienced as you know, in the Spinozan sense, joyful. Um, I think you know, it's not at all, I mean, it's not a new observation now at all to, to say that, you know, neoliberalism works through the violent reduction of all spaces of collective agency and a sort of a, patho a pathologization of collectivity, a pathologization of trans individuality, in fact, I think. And uh, but I think it's useful to have a sense of the extent to which practices or positive practices of solidarity are always um, you know, to some extent, have, have to try to reverse that because I think it raises an interesting question about this kind of affective quality of practices of solidarity and and political practices or, or political and cultural practices which have some capacity for radicalization, for mobilization, or for the facilitation of solidarity. Which is, I mean, it, it's on the one hand, I mean, obviously, one of the conclusions of this sort of line of thinking is always that in some sense you know they have to be there always has to be some sort of experience of empowerment some experience some sense of ex expansive possibility as you know for any sort of mode of radicalization or, or attempt to construct collective agency to be possible and, and, in, and when you say that in this sort of context that always sounds really obvious it sounds like well, of course everybody knows that how could it be any different but it's it's always important to underline that 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 does go against a certain kind of common sense, which is very very uh, widespread, or, you know, uh, on the left a lot of the time, which is the assumption that well, actually, what makes people what makes people will make people radical is the experience of oppression going past a certain threshold. That you know, if people are oppressed enough, they'll be radicalized. And I think, I mean, this is something I'm always saying, like in talks, I'm always saying in different contexts. Like, a all the all the historical empirical evidence shows that's not true. So that people will be, so people can be subject to centuries of you know enslavement, yeah, you know, and it, and it won't change. That it's always the case that actually what radicalizes people is, however momentary, something shifts 
in you know in the chemical composition something shifts in the social situation something shifts somehow that gives a, some experience of potential agency some kind of potential um you know i mean even in a situation like now in a situation like lockdown you know it's a very ambivalent situation because you know on the one hand because but the the sense that people have of some potential some you know p potentiality in the situation is the fact that well it's actually a massive expression of collective agency the fact that we can suddenly all change what we're doing all the time like in a very you know d deliberate way so that's experience but it also i think it raises interesting questions about well what's the sort of you know what's the sort of you know politico aesthetic value of, of affect which don't necessarily sit easily on either side of that equation like what you know what's the political you know what's the politico aesthetic value of, of anger or a certain kind of anger given that anger on the one hand can be you know linked to rage resentment and the sort of you know the uh, the express and the the fruitless expression of weakness on the other hand you know it can be it's it's there's no question that anger is always you know is also part of a sort of expression of you know refusal and i guess like one and so i'm always worrying about this i'm always worrying about well what's that what's the place is there any place for anger like is anger or should we or you know is there no real place for anger in uh, in a properly conceived sort of you know affect, radical affective politics and i guess what well, one answer to that is that well maybe maybe what's required you know maybe it's anger free from all resentment is what in, is in some sense like a, yeah a way of naming a kind of animating affect which can make sort of resistance to injustice possible and certain kinds of solidarity relations to solidarity possible i mean the, the final thing i would say as well and again i mean jason's heard me go on about this before so apologies for that but i mean i mean clearly i mean a, a key a really a key theme when thinking about any notion of solidarity negative or positive is this notion of interests the idea of shared interests being shared or interest being not shared and i sit and actually in the book that um i'm working on with that with alex williams who coined the term negative solidarity we sort of the conceptual framework we're sort of working on with for that which it is which is trying to, partly is trying to develop a conceptualization a, you know a, a sort of theory of interest a sort of idea of uh, what interests are and how they can be categorized and how they can be and how you know and how far you can go in conceptualizing all political motivation as, as always an expression of interest in some sense and uh, and one of the ideas we're sort of playing with is this idea that well every, everybody's everybody has the same interest as everybody else at a certain utopian level you know of, of possible maximal realization at what jody dean calls the communist horizon you know everybody's you know men's interest and women's interest you know people of color's interest and white people's interest you know everybody's interest even the interest of, even the interest of the of the bourgeois and the workers you know are ultimately the same if if what yours if the objective is if you could achieve full communism you know, then everybody would find their their interests maximized and by interest i mean it's kind of general capacity you know an abstractly you know conceivable capacity to act in the world you know as freely as possible but the shorter a time frame you're working in the, the sort of and the lower your horizon in some sense uh the further you get from that so that when people are um, if you if people are only operating at a very low level of imaginative possibility a very low level of imaginative capacity or only imagining what would be possible or conceivable in a very short time frame then the the expression of interests can become purely defensive you know it can become you know it's white people you know it's and, and on, on you know and white workers do have an interest in you know defending their their differential you know their material interest in defending their, their wage differential against black workers to the extent that if if it's completely for if the possibility even of a kind of mild social democratic reform which would benefit all of them is completely foreclosed and so a negative solidarity i think seems you know from that point of view you can say is as, as being something is being what gets expressed at a moment when you know you're sort of at the lowest level you know you're at you're at the level where really you can't really imagine people can't really imagine any kind of um they can't even really imagine their their their, their current kind of you know the current capacities being def being sustained they can only really imagine that some kind of ongoing reduction of their of their own capacities such that ultimately they, they do have a source of interest in reducing other people's capacities because at least then their relative capacities would at least continue you know not not to shrink any further 
so there's something about a sort of um well that's very abstract but i think but i think that's a potential sort of model like for thinking about uh, negative solidarity as well as positive solidarity that you know and i think uh, and i think it's related to you know, it's related to issues like like the covid crisis related to issues like climate change because a great deal really seems to me to hang and this also this is a model which does a lot to explain the kind of generational character of political motivations at the present time as well or, or the apparent sort of generational character that people um if you the, the really a, a great deal hangs on on the very simple question of well how far in the future can people imagine any kind of political program or political objectives being realized you know because if people really can't imagine even six months into the future that they, they really don't believe that anything that you're talking about that might happen six months in the future then they're going to be they're going to be reactionary they just are going to be whereas you know to the extent that people can actually buy into the possibility of a pro project I mean, this is, the, this is the problem with the Green New Deal. The problem for the Green, the fundamental political problem for an affective problem for the Green New Deal is to sell the Green New Deal. You've got to get a, a large number of people to actually, you know, believe or act as if they believe in a project which is going to take at least ten years to really, you know, have any kind of concrete effect or any kind of, you know, substantial effect. So I think that's some that those are potentially useful, you know, uh, thoughts and, way, and ways of thinking thinking about these things. I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. And next we have Joe Isaacson. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> thank you. And I just want to thank Philip and Sean and Bruno and Kyle and all my co panelists. Um, and also I want to thank my friends, um, Maya, Hunter, Ben, and Marsh, who watched The Lighthouse recently with me, because I'm going to try to talk about uh, negative solidarity, um, sort of from my uh, horror feminist perspective by looking at the film, uh, The Lighthouse. Um, so I'm just going to read a little something about that. Um, whew. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted two baffling contradictions and impediments to left solidarity. First, we know that the majority of us are in a precarious position. We are low waged, we are part time, we lack social support, we are paycheck or medical procedure away from abject poverty. And yet many of us still identify with forces of austerity and deprivation. The pandemic only exacerbates this disjunct as millions become unemployed, lose their health care, or go into insurmountable debt. Secondly, we see during this pandemic that what has proved to be essential consists largely of the forms of labor so often denigrated by the imagination of austerity, reproductive labor, feminized labor, migrant labor, service labor, as Tithi Bhattacharya and Sue Ferguson, as well as uh, Maga Miranda and Annie McClanahan have talked about in their panels for Red May. Um, despite their proven necessity, many continue to disparage those who do these forms of labor as weak, lazy, parasitic, and undeserving of help. Today, I want to talk about Robert Eggers' recent proto-quarantine horror film, The Lighthouse, as an illustration of the deep currents of desire and imagination that subtend the patriarchy-soaked, self-destructive, and world-destructive logic behind what Jason, following Alex Williams, calls negative solidarity. Um, Egger's previous more widely lauded film, The Witch, was another exercise in mining history to reflect on current strains of patriarchal identification. Here, an isolated family's pubescent daughter is made into a scapegoat as she exposes the family's apparent puritanical austerity as a cesspool of forbidden desires, and finally rebels to live deliciously, as she says, with a coven of satanic witches. In the lighthouse, we see already claustrophobic uh, lens titans, um, narratively and formally. We see only two men, Thomas Wake, played by Willem Dafoe, and Ephraim Winslow, played by Robert Pattinson, locked in a power struggle based on values of masculinity and austerity. Wake is a longtime wiki or lighthouse supervisor who is overseeing Winslow's apprenticeship. Through most of the film, Winslow's low paying, difficult, precarious reproductive labor is demeaned and discounted by Wake. And yet, rather than rebel, Winslow only pushes himself harder, masochistically identifying with his father figure like supervisor, who at one point appears to him as the god Neptune himself. 
Oh, by the way, I meant to say at the beginning of this that there's a lot of spoilers. I don't know how to talk about films without spoiling the hell out of them. So just beware if you want to watch this later or something. Um, in this, he is the model, that is um, Winslow, of the logic Jason outlines. Without the fantasy of mobility and accumulation, he connects to the ideal of work as discipline with his toughness, hardness, and discipline, the only joys left. In this logic, as Jason says, self-transformation becomes the source of validation. In other words, what keeps this self-destructive logic in place is an intense investment in a vision of the self as hardworking, self-sacrificing, and self-reliant. And this maps onto a masculine persona that defines maleness as rigid and contained, contrasted against abjected feminine archetypes of soft, spreading, flooding pliancy. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. In the era Jason calls late neoliberalism, this gives new relevance to the quest question um, Klaus Tavelite asked after studying the culture of 1930s fascist masculinity. He asks, is it true, as many feminists claim, that fascism is simply the norm for males living under capitalist patriarchal conditions? This may be true in different ways in different moments. Um, but the masculine ethos described in Tavolite's exploration converges with late neoliberalism's affects and imagination that arise when the pleasures and positive cathexes of consumerism are no longer available. Instead, we have austerity, hard work, and what Jason calls negative individuality, a sense of the self as an island that precludes solidarity. In the lighthouse, this negative individuality appears as a guard against anything soft or feminine in the men themselves, their environment, or their labor. And yet this feminine excess crashes in waves against the phallic lighthouse that Wake and Winslow strain to preserve, even as it erodes their psychic integrity. Immediately upon arriving at their work site, it becomes evident that the bulk of the labor the men must do is reproductive, primarily cooking, cleaning, and tending to the light. In order to disguise the feminine quality of this work, the men turn it into a sadistic power play, with Wake demeaning Winslow and rhetorically compensating for his diminished position with tall tales and self-mythologizing. More than a fantasy of a world without women, this is a renunciatory fantasy of a world without what are imagined to be feminine qualities. This pact of exclusion drives the men into a contest to relegate one another to a feminized position. As Wake is the boss and the more seasoned lunatic, he gets the upper hand for the first two acts. This begins with him forcing Winslow to repeat his cleaning efforts over and over, always finding them inadequate. The gendered racialized nature of the humiliation becomes explicit as Winslow asserts, I never intended to be no housewife or no slave. Wake responds by doubling down on his treatment of Winslow as a housewife, a lazy worker, and is implicitly effeminate or gay. He says, and I apologize for not being Willem Dafoe, <laughs> you lion Job, tis begrimed and bedamned, unwashed, unwiped, and bestained. You swab it again and you swab it proper. Suck off every speck of rust till all those nails sparkle like a sperm whale's pecker. Um, <laughs> in the lighthouse, no reproductive labor or activity can occur without passing through a gendered gauntlet. Even wake sleep and waking and walking is roughed up by his constant aggressive farting a form of taking up space and marking territory. Yet Wake and Winslow do not seem to have much to do but reproductive labor. In response, they create their own Sisyphean conditions as they strive to keep excessive, luxuriant, feminized forces at bay. There are no women on the island except for in dreams. However, in an interview with Vox, Eggers notes that he conceives of Winslow's fantasy mermaid and the sea itself as the film's two female figures, as well as the most powerful characters. In the end, these feminized forces prevail, leaving both Wake and Winslow forgotten to any man, to any time, forgotten to any god or devil, forgotten even to the sea, as Wake had predicted in a majestically florid curse. In their efforts to beat back feminine softness and replace it with masculine hardness, the two conjure the scenes of domestic violence that are secretly playing out behind so many doors as huge surges in domestic abuse are reported in every area of the global lockdown. The isolated men belittle, gaslight, and eventually commit increasingly physical violent acts against each other. In the hothouse of the lighthouse, this exercise of intimate violence can't be detached from fantasy structures around work and austerity. Drawing attention to this invisible connection in the real world 
in which domestic and work spheres now appear so atomized and yet are increasingly entwined. This vision of these men coupled as abusive boss and abused worker and as abusive husband and abused wife momentarily gives way to reveal the desire for another world that lurks below these hardened masculine carapaces. The men dance in a tender close embrace with Winslow draped over Wake's shoulder, caressing his back as Wake nuzzles Winslow's neck. Wake softly sings a ballad. On a Monday morning, my lover lies asleep. My lover is warm, gentle caress, just to share her pillow. In this sentimental idyll, we shift into an alternate utopian imaginary, tonally distant from the rest of the film. A Monday morning free of labor, filled with gentle intimacy. Although we have to have up to now seen Wake as a grimy, farting, sadistic, old, salty dog, the actors appear transformed and we take the intimacy seriously. But it's only a glimpse of queer living deliciously before the hardness of negative individuality reasserts itself. On the brink of a kiss, the men abruptly shift into a fist, fist fight because of course they have to. This violence is in line with hardened identification with an imagined white productivist masculine labor and a continued disavowal of the feminine socially reproductive labor we all depend on. It is eventually revealed that both men have constructed work identities that have little to do with their actual lives. Here the spoilers come fast and furious. Um, Wake describes himself as a sailor who has undergone the greatest trials of suffering, austerity, and endurance. But we learn that he never was a sailor and all his tall tales of treacherous adventures and raucous male camaraderie were fabricated delusions. When Winslow goes and quote, spills his beans, um, an image that conjures domesticity and liquidity itself, we learn that he is not Winslow after all. He is not a freewheeling lumberjack, but a fugitive living through a dead man's stolen identity. The men who appear so authentic to the postmodern eye are self-aware pastiches of archetypes desperately attempting to mythologize themselves and to solidify the myth into fact. This resonates with Jason's remarks on the constructedness of the myth of labor as a collection of everything that has ever been believed. Despite this rejection of women's work, you know, in quotes, it is Winslow's rejection of Wake's cooking that unleashes the latter's most violent curse, showing his ambivalent relationship to socially reproductive labor. Not only is this repression a rejection of tenderness and solidarity, but also of the men's potential pride in their own essential labor. Nancy Fraser calls this process, quote, a relation of separation, cum dependence, cum disavowal. What we see here in the men's interpersonal death dance, a rejection of socially reproductive labor, is what Fraser points to on a structural level. She insists that we live in a state of denial about effective and reproductive labor, imagining that it is dispensable when, as she says, without it, there could be no culture, no economy, no political organization. This disavowal leads the characters to choose violence and self-destruction rather than empathy, tenderness, and mutual aid. The final blow comes to the men through their passion for the lighthouse the lighthouse beacon, which like the box that contains a nuclear device in the noir film, Kiss Me Deadly, represents their desire not only for self-destruction, but for utter world annihilation. This phallic beacon has become central to the self mythology the men have constructed. And as in the Oedipus myth of willful blindness to the truth, it burns out Winslow's eyes. All along the men have had a choice between an intimate relationship of care or perhaps even love with each other's warm, pliant, dirty flesh and the cold obliterating abstraction of the phallic beacon. But the choice seems foreordained. Wake has already served Winslow his fate, sending, quote, black waves teeming with salt foam to smother this young mouth with pungent slime to choke ye and gorging your organs till ye turn blue and bloated with bilge and brine and can scream no more, or so goes his curse. I can't help but see this death-driven commitment to plague and abstraction in light of recent defenses of the economy over the lives of the frail and sick in our country. Texas politician Dan Patrick presented this myth of sacrifice as a heroic narrative. Our elders have the chance to die martyrs, to overcome their status as useless grandparents who have no legitimate labor left in them and can only give the next generation worthless love. A negative solidarity, it seems, can be built on the rejection of one's own old age, among other senseless and cruel prejudices. Just this week, Chris Christie asked, 
Of course, everybody wants to save every life they can, but the question is, towards what end ultimately? As if the abstract accumulation of capital is the only imaginable horizon for life. But if the care pace of negative solidarity is built, as Jason argues, on imagination and affect, it holds its own negation. And as I am skeptical of an alternative positive solidarity, um, maybe due to an early situationist influence, we might call instead for a negative negative solidarity based on the abolition of identities rather than the solidification of them. In her introduction to male fantasies, Barbara Ehrenreich characterizes the counterpoint to the death cult of austerity like this. What Th Tavolite saw in communism, in female sexuality, was a joyous commingling, as disorderly as life. In this fantasy, the body expands in its senses, its imaginative reach to fill the earth. And we are at last able to rejoice in the softness and the permeability of the world around us, rather than holding ourselves back in lonely dread. This is the fantasy that makes us, both men and women, human, and makes us sometimes revolutionaries in the cause of life. So that's what I've got. Thank you, Joe. And our final speaker today is Steve Shabiro. Um, okay. Um, I don't have anything as organized to say as with the other three speakers, but I will try to be not too disorganized. Basically, I have a number of notes and questions and responses, which may or may not really fit together. But okay, so um, my sense of negative solidarity actually comes from, or I can tie it to a specific experience. I was at an academic conference in Milwaukee and I went with a friend of mine to a bar one evening and my friend was, unlike me, was very interested in like stirring shit up and arguing with people, which is something I am totally averse to ever doing. But nonetheless, they ended up getting the big argument with the bouncer at the bar who was a very proud working class Republican. And he talked about how he had three jobs and did all this kind of extra work all the time and how pissed off he was that you know, these welfare people on welfare would have their, you know, DVD players at enormous TVs and just spend the time watching movies and never doing a lick of work. And he just said, and I'm working so hard. This is my third job, you know, I have three jobs every week. And, you know, it, it pisses him off that these other people would, you know, have any source of enjoyment whatsoever, basically, when without doing the work that he did. But the tone of it was less um, a kind of negative austerity thing that a kind there was something very you know exuberant about his sort of being proud of his own hard work as opposed to the people who are worthless because they're lazy and probably also we didn't say this because they're black so i don't know i mean i'm i sort of think about that as a limit to the kind of stuff jason putting lord on was talking about it's not just identifying with the grim necessity of all this horrible stuff I have to do and therefore no, I mean, it partly is. I mean, it's sort of saying, I don't get this shit so nobody else should also. But there's something very self-affirmative about that, which is very scary to me. I mean, and so I sort of am wondering about that. Um, I might tie this to something I can't quote because I don't remember. It's a book I read or an article I read, but I don't have to remember the source, but it was about Tea Party supporters in basically the Appalachians, in West Virginia and Tennessee, Kentucky. And so these are mostly very poor, struggling white people. And the reason they hate Obamacare and hate all these government things is because what they're thinking is not just black people will get this and I'm a white person, I work. They're really thinking my second cousin who's addicted to opioids and can't get his act together to a job is gonna get this. Why should he get it when he's been such a fuck up? It has something to do with a desperation that, you know, a, a subconscious realization that does, for the grace of God, go on. This is my second cousin. This is not an alien foreigner. But, but again, there's something weird there, which is more, which needs more examination. And I'd also relate that to the fact that what a lot of liberals, as opposed to more left people, want, if you look in the, you know, recent Democratic primary situation, is to have. Whereas Sanders say wants you know Medicare for all, people like Biden or some of the losing candidates like Buttigieg and others, they said they want means testing. They don't want to let anybody go to college because they'd be pissed off that Donald Trump could send his kids to college for free. So therefore, they they insist on you know something which actually costs a lot more money, and which would lead to a two-tier system. So 
and that's sort of part of the problem with Obamacare also. It's sort of like, so these people who are just barely making their way are pissed off, but then partly they're pissed off not wrongly because the people who get the free treatment are actually getting inferior treatment. If we don't have Medicare for all, then we have two medical systems, and the people who are in systems will get crummier medical care than people who can pay more. And liberalism actually pushes that forward by all their things that we have to have means testing. We can't just give this to everybody because, and even especially Buttigieg was the one who really, whose hypocrisy really annoyed me the most because he sort of said, well, I don't think poor people should have to pay so that rich people can send their kids to college for free. When you know that rich people are not going to send their kids to a public university for free when they can send them to Stanford or Yale or Harvard for $50,000 a year, which they can afford. I mean, it's, but anyway, so the structure of resentment and anger has a kind of class dimension, which is more complicated than anything that's been said. Not that I have an answer to how that can, can be parsed, but it seems to me to be an important part of the picture. Okay, then moving from that, what I'm interested in is also, again, that part of the picture is the stuff Jace is quoting from Frederick Lourdon about people identifying with their straightened situations and identifying with austerity because if they separate everybody else should but i think that ignores the ethics the, the sense of transgression which we have so much on let's say on the far right today or i mean it's sort of like i've been very interested in questions of a history of transgression throughout the 20th century transgression was associated with avant-garde art movements and also with political left movements it's sort of like, you know, it goes back to Victorian morality and gleefully violating the expectations of what propriety and proper behavior is. It's no institutional family. It's all kinds of, it's all kinds of things. You can see it in like the 1960s and 70s. It's sort of like the 60s counterculture, both the more political and less political signs were all about transgression, scorning the standards of the middle, of the you know, stuffy middle class, which is also the standards of authority. But it seems to me that that's been totally inverted in the last 20, 30 years. Right now, it's only the right wing who's transgressive. You have, I mean, Donald Trump is transgressive, whereas the Democrats don't have a transgressor among any of the people they were considering for, for, the, for the presidency. It's sort of like there's a certain gleefulness. I mean, this is also sort of like these white people, affluent white people going to the beach and saying, I don't care about coronavirus because, you know, I mean, it's not going to stop my, if they're 20, the same, but it's not going to stop my need to party. If they're 50, they're saying it's because I need to get a haircut. I need to, I need the services, you know, perform for me and I want everything to open up. I mean, it's, it's sort of sense part of the way that works is a kind of gleefully transgressive, there's a gleefully transgressive aspect to it. And I think we need to account for why transgression is now on the side of power and the ruling class rather than on the side of um, rather than on the side of what's what's not wanted or disliked. So um, I'm just kind of thinking through lots of those issues, okay? And I don't have any answer here, any really clear answer, but I'll link it to, if I have a few moments, I'll link to a couple other things. Um, one is, um, of course, several people have mentioned the whole question of scarcity and how scarcity is in fact capitalism manufactures abundance, but then turns it into scarcity. Everything has to be scarce because if it's not scarce, there isn't competition, there isn't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I don't know. There, there seems to me to be a link between, I've, I've said this in the past, there seems to be a link between scarcity and a kind of sense of desire is infinite. I mean, bourgeois political economy is based on the idea that no matter what happens, you will never be able to realize desires. That's why you always have to prioritize. So people have to be rational choice, you know, weighing all their alternatives and seeing their limited budgets and stuff like that. Um, so scarcity seems tied to this kind of myth of desire, which is what sort of nourishes the, I don't give a fuck about anybody else individualism. Okay. So, I mean, one thing I've wondered, wondered, wondered about for a long time is other models of desiring and other models of wanting than ones which are in this thing. And in what I've written in the past, I've mentioned things like Oscar Wilde's argument for socialism as the only thing which allows people to be selfish, or um, Charles Fourier's idea of social realization of everybody's desires through these kinds of incredibly weird 
and wonderfully hilarious arrangements. You know, so um, I don't know what to make of that either, but um, I don't, okay, I don't have a conclusion. I'm just trying to sort of throw some of these things out as suggestions of things to think about in connection to the trends, in connection to this issue of why negative solidarity is so big in America today. Okay, that's what I had to say, basically. Okay, um, thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to present some questions that could um, pull these things together. Uh, but I think I'll start with one um, for Jason. Um, in the in your description of the late neoliberal period, you talk about the shift from the pleasure in one's skills to the pleasure of employment itself. And I was wondering if that pleasure is a necrotizing pleasure, like the more you enjoy it, the more it's killing you. And um, if what one is enjoying there is um, the vampire's kiss, it's dead labor, the um, vampire-like feeds uh, by sucking on living labor. Um, I guess that's not so much a question as like a clever remark, but can you just um, discuss maybe the negativity or is there something death bound about um, the pleasure one takes in employment itself? Like the more abstract it becomes, does it become more death-like? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that um, I mean, partly what I was trying to to get at is is a strange um, point where you know pains are turned into trials and tribulations are turned into pleasure through a sort of like transmutation through feelings of pride and and self regard um, and. And to kind of think a much more, I think more than say Lord Donald's work, a much more ambivalent understanding of, of, of affects um, around around work, um, in a sense that that um, and there I was thinking about the idea that that there does seem to be a strange kind of um, on the one hand, there's a part of, of contemporary sort of entrepreneurial discourse, which really is this language of like, find something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And you get this sort of testimony from people who own their own like brew pubs or whatever, that like, oh my God, I love beer so much. And I, I'm always working. I don't even notice how much I'm always working. Why would I ever want to take a day off? This is like, this is my passion. Uh, where it's, it is tied to a, a concrete, you know, skill and a, and a specific thing you're doing, but there does seem to be this sort of like strange kind of like engagement in activity itself. I mean, in the word itself, entrepreneur, which is, you know, an undertaking with an unspecified object or, or thing you're doing, right? When someone says, I'm an entrepreneur, um, uh, there's a certain sense in which like it's a valorization of that like of just like I'm always out doing things and I'm kind of indifferent to what the thing what the things I'm connecting are and that sense of I mean you know, this ties into you know things people have, have noticed on a much more mundane level a kind of weird valorization of activity and busyness itself as like look at me look at all I'm doing isn't this a testimony to like how important and worthwhile I am, you know, which, which just to kind of tie it into, to, I think the um, Johanna's discussion of, of the lighthouse, which I really liked. And the one thing I really got out of the lighthouse in thinking about what's going on now is that like, you know, the people who are clamoring for work, and of course, a lot of things going on with this sort of demands to like open up the economy. I mean, some people really are worried about, you know, how they're going to have money to survive. And that's true. Um, but there's also this strange sense in which there's plenty to, I always think there's plenty to do at home. Why does that not seem enough like work, right? Why does the work have to not be like, I'm home, I have my kids, I have my house, I have all these things I could, I could be doing. Um, but it, it really is a desire to like be employed and be engaged. And there's a certain kind of, of, uh, 
recognition through through the wage that that somehow the the home can always be seen as sort of inadequate and failing failing to respond to um and to go back to the, the lighthouse i always thought this was like after watching it i thought this is why the whole thing becomes a fight about who gets to be up in the lighthouse itself right like that's the real work of the lighthouse like the light that it shines out to ships that are doing important cargo is the real work of the lighthouse eating food and and keeping the floors clean is like the not real work of the lighthouse. The lighthouse is the light. You want to be in the light, right? That's the the kind of productive ideal of 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 the lighthouse. Thanks. Um, sorry for the. I keep having this lag of muting, unmuting. Um, so I I would like to pose a question um, to you, anyone, or maybe perhaps for each of you in turn. Uh, which came through the chat, and that is that so far we've most we've considered negative solidarity under capitalism, but how might we think of negative solidarity for socialism or under socialism? Is there a socialist negative solidarity? And I, that's for anyone to take on. I don't know whether this really answers that, but it's like um, there are different ways of thinking about what we mean by collectivity and solidarity and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes people seem to think it either provingly or disapprovingly it means like we all have to love one another and think one another's wonderful and cool and spend all the time with them. And um, that's really a kind of weird distortion. I mean, what, what collectivity and solidarity mean is that the basic lie behind sort of American hyper individualism is that, you know, just like we've said in the time of COVID 19, nobody could be alone at home without all these people who still have to go out and do this very dangerous work for very low wages. I mean, is that there's no such thing as a non interdependent self. Um, and I mean, now even at Alex, you know, we need other social people, other people, and all these relations, this intricate web, this, I mean, society, which, you know, Every, all, every, everything, or get food, have technology, all the things I do require the existence and the labor of so many other people. In the same way that everything my body does requires all these bacteria and other things which are in my gut, and which are, again, doing their own thing. And it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has the same idea or everybody wants to do the same thing, but that everybody has some kind of realization that this thing will only work if we have this kind of mutualism. So, I mean, it's sort of like, that is even that's often ignored in discourse, certainly in individuals' discourse, which tends to negate the stuff that's going on. But it's also sometimes ignored when they're kind of overly sappy things about how we should, you know, what solidarity might mean. I mean you know, I'm, I guess I'm just saying solidarity doesn't mean I have to love everybody else, but that I have to understand that I don't exist if they don't exist, and vice versa. I don't know if that answers anything, but that's yeah. It's. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah, Joe. Oh, I was gonna say, like, I mean, that in my end of my talk, I kind of mentioned that I feel like the answer to negative solidarity isn't positive solidarity, that it would be, I mean, any communist solidarity would have to be negative. Um, because I, I think it's in Maya Gonzalez's work, she talks about this, like, um, you, you know, you don't want to have this Habermasian imaginary of like, we're all on this equal plane and we can all participate in, in solidarity as sort of equals without kind of, you know, deconstructing, you know, what, how we would participate. But I think um, there would have to be a kind of understanding that we'd have to have the abolition of identities to really participate in any kind of meaningful solidarity that preserve differences and preserve like that understanding of inequality. So I think negative, when I first heard that title, I was like a little in doubt because I wanted to keep the negation for myself. <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I think that you could have a kind of different kind of negative solidarity. Um, um, sorry, I'm just, uh, reviewing some notes. Um, mm, 
Um, I wonder if um, um, like um, Stephen was saying that uh, collectivity doesn't necessarily mean unity or uniformity. Um, yeah, I sort of like to still stay with the end of Joe's paper about the negative, negative solidarity. Um, uh, because like a simpler schema would be that, you know, negative solidarity is death bound as in the photo we showed at the beginning of the pro death riot in Ohio. And then the positive solidarity would be life and love. But um, I wonder if negative, negative solidarity, I mean, I'm not sure what that is yet, but um, could it, yeah, I don't know, like somehow intervene at that place where both collectivity and individuation are blocked off in the neoliberal negative solidarity. Like could this other negative, negative solidarity um, somehow liberate the dead from the way they're being used in the other negative solidarity? Um, if anyone can untangle that, I would be grateful. <laughs> or you could just like drop that and move on to something else. So that's open. Um, so, uh, uh, sorry, you, you go down, you go down. Uh, so I was going to say a couple things about that. Cause I'm, 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 I'm trying to think through this negative, negative solidarity. And I think the, the way that I think about it is, um, there is, uh, I mean, it's a negative, uh, in the sense that usually solidarity is attached to some kind of shared uh, identity, right? That you have solidarity of people as a specific type of people, um, and it can be as you know workers or as as a particular nation or particular other kind of thing. Like it's based, it has some kind of positive thing. And I think that for me to understand the negative, negative is to think about a solidarity without kind of conditions. But uh, the second thing. Um, about negative solidarity. I mean, here I, tr I try to sort of analyze the sort of what I've, the, the affective composition of, of negative solidarity. It seemed like other people, and I, like Alex Williams, when he wrote about it, other people who've taken up similar kind of notions, stress the strange kind of uh, perverse egalitarianism of it, right? That it does have a claim of some kind of, like the, the claim of like, well, why do these people have this or that um, advantage that, that, that others don't have has this strange but strangely downwardly mobile sense of, um, of, of collectivity. I think um, when I first wrote the blog piece about it, I was struck by this, this article from, from uh, about the uh, uh, transit strike in, in, in San Francisco, where they basically, you know, pulled you know, it was very framed as this, like, oh, here's this liberal city, and people are upset because this these people have a union and they're able to even go on strike, and and the sense of like, of like, uh, you know, why do these people have this thing if everyone doesn't have it? But it's not really framed in terms of the the everyone. It's really framed in terms of these last remnants of these sort of positive exceptions, right? Like, why do some people? Uh, still have a union, still have the possibility of something like, you know, like some of the hostility aimed towards teachers um, has that same kind of, of, of sense. So there is, there is a kernel, and this is what, an, another way to approach it, and I think it interests me, there is a kernel of, of solidarity, even in the negative solidarity, but it is, um, it is a kernel which, which, which is only ever articulated in a sort of downwardly uh, mobile negative way. And it goes back to what I think what Jeremy was pointing at in the sense of the different temporalities, right? That like in the short term, you know, there is a sense in which uh, in a short term, we're often forced 
to play zero sum games where where the advantages of one work against the advantages of others um, and uh, a true solidarity uh, I think would force us to move beyond and, it, and it's difficult to get out of those 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 zero sum games because they are the horizon in which a lot of times we struggle um, and it, it's it seems to me that that um, the kind of solidarity that I'm thinking of, not maybe a negative negative, or I think of, it, of a solidarity without conditions would have to, in some sense, expand the, the temporality and the terrain of conflict, if that makes any sense. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. And I would also, I mean, I would say, um, I would want to robustly defend solidarity as a positive value and say it is categorically not tied to identity. In fact, I would say at a certain, although, although under specific concrete conditions, uh, identities can provide you know, basis, some notion of shared imaginative identity can be a basis for solidarity at, at an appropriate level of abstraction, they're completely opposed to political principles, the principle of solidarity and the principle of identity. And for me, you know, I wrote a blog post a, couple, a few years ago that became, was sort of the basis for my thinking about this called Notes Towards the Theory of Solidarity. And the the, the political instances, I mean, that are really important, they're really important in the sort of imaginary of the British left, at, le at least I was uh, pointing to was the um, the Grunwick dispute in, in Britain in the 1970s, which is famous because it's a dispute where a, um, a, labor, a labor dispute where a strike um, at a film processing plant where most of the workers were first generation women, immigrants from Bangladesh, um, ended up attracting like a lot of support from sort of um, more more quote unquote traditional kind of white you know male white working class trade unionists and it was seen as the high point of developing a kind of anti racist consciousness like in, in British working class politics and it's also it was also it's seen as a kind of crucial moment because it it terrified it really it terrified enough of the kind of a political elite in Britain that they began to become much more receptive to kind of what had been extremely right, seen as fringe right-wing Hayekian ideas. But, you know, that's why it's part of the condition for people like Thatcher. And then there's also the moment in the, the early 80s, which is um, which is dramatised, you know, which is sort of depicted in that movie is sort of just a sort of popular sort of feel-good movie really called Pride, which is uh, lesbian and gays against the minors, when, you know, there was a real... You know, there was a deliberate, you know, practice of, you know, it was the, you know, young sort of queer activists, you know, um, you know, built forming these very, you know, important relationships with striking mine workers. And actually lots of people have seen the movie, but I always tell people what well, you really want to, you want to listen, there's a podcast called Working Class History, which did a, did a really good series of episodes about that incident, which is really interesting because the, the movie kind of makes out like these, um, all these, uh, you know, these white working class like miners had had to have their homophobia kind of overcome in order to form relationships with these queer activists. And historically, it's not really true because most of them had already been through that process because the uh, women's liberation had already kind of radicalized, you know, had a really radicalizing effect like a few years earlier in that in that community. But in all of those instances, anyway, what, but what's really important and what makes them kind of utopian and what makes them inspiring is that I, there isn't it, there isn't a principle of identity you know solidarity is going is work is a principle against identity and it, and it's not even being contained by some it isn't being contained it is it isn't being contained by some bigger identity either really of like the proletariat or the working class you know that that, that isn't really that isn't really uh, what's going on there is a sense of a, of a common enemy and like the uh, there is a sense of a, of a negation in this and, and there is a whole kind of Leclerc and Mufian version of, of that, which would just say, well, it's just an expression of antagonism. It's a, you know, they, 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 it's only because they have a common enemy that they're able to, you know, in the, in the form of the new right, or in the form, you know, in both cases, actually, in the, in the form of the emerging new right, that these otherwise disparate sets of groups have a, are able to make common cause. But I would say, well, nonetheless, it, it's, it, nonetheless, even if that's the case, then what's going on actually in terms of the positive experience and practice of solidarity between those group, groups of people is, is, a, is an anti-identitarian logic, is an anti-identitarian politics. And I think, I think it is really, and I think that is an important, you know, that is important to my conception of it. And I think negative solidarity 
uh, as and I understand it in it just the way Jason was saying, it. it's not an accident. Negative diet, ne negative solidarity of, by contrast often or perhaps always takes on a certain kind of identitarian character. You know, it always, you know, it always, it, it's not an, it's not an accident that it almost always takes on a racist character. You know, in, in contemporary societies, there, there's, there, there, there are very few actually examples of actually existing solidarity that don't have either racist or misogynistic overtones. And I think that's, you know, I think that's sort of significant to the understanding of it. Me anyway. Um, if I could follow up somewhat on, this is a question that also came in through the chat, which is for Jeremy. Um, is there a sense in which current examples of negative solidarities can be considered responses to capitalist hegemony? Is negative solidarity as neoliberal pathology a response to what you call minimum passive consent under capitalist hegemony? So if you could answer and explain that question. <laughs> um, uh, well, minimal passive consent is the idea that, I mean, just to explain the term, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's a term Alex and I get, you know, we, we, it's our sort of elaboration, elaboration of, Gra of the, of, of Gramsci um, remark at one point in, in his writings that, that consent can be, um, the, the, the consent of the, of the subaltern, of the non-hegemonic social groups can be passive or active. I mean, and that's part of a, you know, that's to really, I mean that's relevant to us because you know because it's to, you know that's to do with polemics that I think are, are kind of a bit old fashioned now already. But you know about sort of ten fifteen years ago there was a big tendency uh, amongst sort of theorists to want to say that hegemony there still is. I mean there's I mean still you get people wanting to say that power doesn't doesn't operate in a hegemonic way. There's no such thing as hegemony, and that but that's generally predicated on the an understanding of hegemony according to which what hegemony means is positive active endorsement. Of the sort of of the project or the ideology of the ruling class or what have what have you and like what I was saying earlier about sort of you know in in response to Lordon is I think I, I mean I don't think I mean for the most part I I don't think the I don't think most it, in societies like the United States I don't actually think most people's relationship to hegemonic neoliberalism has ever been that simple I think people have often def, you can defer to it without actually endorsing it on some level and I think actually that's you know, and I think, um, you know, and that is, but that is but minimally passive consent then is when you do that. You don't actually, you don't actually think, yeah, neoliberalism is a good idea. You don't really go along with these basic presuppositions, but you accept it as something you have to sort of go along with. Um, well, how, I mean, negative solidarity as a, as a sort of, you know, response to that and how it, how it relates to that, I guess is, um, well, sure, I think, but if that's not to say, well. I, th I think it really. It, I think you would have to, you know, it, you would have to analyze different concrete instances. So, I mean, there are definitely some. In, I mean, mostly what we've been talking about today. I, I guess this is what the question is responding to. Mostly, actually, we've been talking about instances in which negative sol solidarity is an index of a pretty clear identification and kind of you know acceptance of certain neoliberal norms. So, the people we've been talking about. You know, people who don't like welfare claims sort of resent when welfare claims, or they resent teachers. I mean, they are basically, you know, people who are have are internalizing. You know, I don't. I, I hate the word internalizing, although we always use it because it implies our model of subjectivity. I officially don't endorse, but you know, they've become neoliberal in some way. You know, they're kind of particular. They're resonating with neoliberalism in in some quite coherent way. So that's so they are. Uh, they're, they're interpolated in out is their sense you know they're consenting in a very classical sense they're, they're reproducing neoliberal common sense so i suppose and to that extent yeah i mean of course it is i mean neg negative solidarity is, is just i mean given that on on some fundamental i mean you know on some really basic level liberalism in and bourgeois ideology are just anti-solidaristic you know, they are just against the very they're just against solidarity as a basic social principle which is something that can be yeah, responded to from the right or the left that that's the case but in situations where people are not necessarily that's not necessarily what's happening but something more complicated that's happen is happening i think yeah i mean clearly i don't know if this is really i don't know if this is answering the question adequately but i would say for example i mean there are certain i mean like 
there obviously and this relates to what i was saying i guess about the kind of identitarian you know a certain identitarianism in negative solidarity and if we think about sort of you know racism or kind of anti-immigrant anti anti-immigration anti anti-refugee rhetoric as being manifesting negative solidarity then those instances again i mean i guess that i mean they they sort of what we what would call cons, you know sort of conservative reactionary rather than simply neoliberal modes of um negative solidarity would you know i guess would be would constitute instances in which to some extent people are reacting against or people are, are re, people are reacting against certain features of neoliberalism they're reacting against certain fe as aspects of it but not in a not in a way that is going to actually challenge it in any fundamental way and i guess this is this is another feature of the notion of sort of minimally passive consent or for you know in that you can you can object to something on terms that are not going to fundamentally change it that are not going to fundamentally uh, you know really constitute any form of real opposition to it so i guess there are instances in, in which um i guess there i guess i guess there probably are instances in in which you know i'm i'm thinking you know that are sort of maga people you know clearly are do practice what we might call negative solidarity um in relate you know in their sort of racism and their kind of you know and many of their attitudes but they're also to some extent you know reacting against um you know, reacting against, you know, many features, you know, many features of neoliberalism, you know, it's, and, and certainly, and certainly what they're reacting against in actual class terms is the, um, you know, is, you know, the, is, a, is the culture of a certain, you know, a sort of cosmopolitan, of a, a certain sort of cosmopolitan technocratic neoliberal elite. Actually, I mean, thinking about that, this is a slightly different point, but I was thinking about this earlier when Stephen was talking about, and, um, you know, some of these, you know, some of the issues raised by Bill Don's analysis and, and, and when thinking about this in what I would say is to, to think about all this in hegemonic terms and to think about the analysis that Jason was expounding of Lourdes and was kind of giving his own gloss on Lourdes in these sort of hegemonic terms what I would say it's important to, to do is to sort of acknowledge the extent to which clearly all of these all of these experiences and the way that people relate to these to, to you know certain practices of neoliberalism and what have you are all are all differentiated by class and sort of class fraction to an extent. So that that exact that business of like loving your work and loving being obsessed with your work and like loving being in your job. I mean, it's a point that was kind of brought out by people, Boltanski and Chappello kind of decades ago, really. That well, clearly there is there is a kind of elite of people like in the tech sector, say in particular, and you know working in some working think tanks and working in some jobs who do live like that. Like they do live they do like they like working 16 hours a day like they do love their jobs you know they do they are they actually do kind of resonate with that frequency without with very little dissonance and um and you know the the way and i think you know to describe what that this that as a sort of as a situation of hegemony is to say that well basically you're, you're offered and i think this is what lord on is sort of getting at and, and, and lord on in some ways like offers a really good uh, description of, of the situation is that you know you're basically offered a certain set of rewards and a certain set sense of both self-worth but real material was simply uh, to the extent that you're you know to the extent that you're yeah you you you're willing or able to you know as i say to kind of resonate with that or to i mean i mean literally to do that you know to fulfill those criteria and um i think uh you know i mean it's certainly something i mean it's something you see in contemporary academic life i think you know to do you know just this, the, the, I, I think that you know part of the affective state of being a contemporary academic is it you know, if you get one of those weeks where you're just obsessively working on your book all week and there's no other distractions and that, that's all you have to do then you feel like you've done it right you feel like that was what you were supposed to do you feel like that okay that that and you feel sort of rewarded for it and you're conscious that you know you've uh, you've added to the little tally of points which is gonna you know add up to your like next job or your next promotion at some point and you know and that is the extent to which you know even sort of academics are you know are to some you know are, are, are you know are offered the opportunity to participate in this kind of you know to go along with this sort of hege hegemonic vector if you like which i think um you know, Lord Don is sort of describing. So uh, I guess that sort of, I mean, that's how I would see some of this, uh, some of these things, you know, that is the sort of hegemonic gloss I would, I would put on, on these things, I think. Thanks.
So we're coming up on two hours and I think I would like to conclude with a red May question for everyone or anyone, which is uh, which also came in through the chat. How should communists and socialists be responding to these neoliberal negative solidarities? Is how can we confront them or overcome them? If anyone has a prescription or analysis of that. Well, I'll say really, I'll just really quickly, almost any opportunity, however banal, for people to experience collectivity, like not as a site of kind of degradation, pathologization, just not to experience other people as a hassle and as a problem, you know, it, it, it has some positive value. You know, it's really banal, but almost any, almost, almost anything uh, does. That's, that, I'm sure other people can say more substantial things. Um, the other thing, and I think this comes up when, when Stephen was saying, I think that that there is a sense in which, um, you know, because we've been talking about negative solidarity uh, versus solidarity, and, and there is a sense in which uh, one has to sort of think like, and here to think about what's happening right now with COVID-19, right, there is a strange kind of um, strange kind of solidarity, but there's also a strange kind of, uh, you know, I think a lot of what, what people are reacting to are people who, uh, uh, like a, a liberal kind of fetishization of rules and procedures. Um, and, and the extent to which people find transgressing those to be kind of appealing. Um, and I do think that one has to, um, you know, I mean, I think uh, Jeremy's right about any sense of collectivity is not a hassle, but I think also the sense that that uh, that negative solidarity cannot be opposed by a, a simple adherence to already existing rules, structures, and norms of social interaction. It always has to have, I mean, the opposite of negative solidarity is a solidarity that that has both a broader horizon, as Jeremy was saying, but also it's it's it, uh, I don't want to say transgression, but a sense of a kind of revolutionary dimension. And I think that, that if you lose that, um, then there is the negative solidarity always, always wins because it always seems to be both, both simultaneously. And this is, I think it's appeal. It's simultaneously more immediate because it works with the existing uh, uh, horizon of possibilities, but it also has this sense of being more like expressive of uh, a kind of transgressive possibility. I mean, the the you know, I mean, the ultimate appeal of this is like people having like you know, dimension of this is like people arming themselves to go to state capitals and saying, we want haircuts, right? I mean, it's a strange combination of both a total acceptance of wage labor as the only structure of our existence. And it has this bizarre kind of transgressive dimension. Like, look at me, I have an assault rifle and I'm like breaking all the rules. And it's like, it has both this kind of anarchic appeal to like, here, I'm going to break the rules and do everything, but it also has this like limited horizon of the imagination. And I think that, that the, um, you have to both expand the horizon of possibilities while, while simultaneously uh, uh, holding open the possibility that, 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 actual solidarity, actual, actual collective action is going to be something fundamentally different than the sort of reified um, norm-based models of collective action that we're given. You know, the response is not to get a, a mass that says vote on it. My God, like what a horrible kind of thing. Uh, uh, what you see, I mean, that to me is the, is the worst kind of, of, of you know, offering people this, this attenuated, and norm-based kind of collectivity as a response to to a real sense of, of fear and anxiety. Yeah, thanks. Um, does anyone else want to speak to that point of uh, how to work against negative solidarities? Or 
have we overcome them to fare thee well? Uh, well, in that case, I'm going to hand it over to Philip. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks very much. This is uh, a sort of compelling discussion that never ends. I've heard Jason give this paper before a couple of times, and I've read it, and it always uh, it always resonates in a different way each time I hear it. In terms of uh, uh, you know the notion of an effective economy. Uh, as the one thing that survives of when everything else in neoliberalism, it's, it's uh, rationale, it's uh, practices and so forth, all those are discredited uh, maybe by its inability to develop, uh, deliver ventilators or masks or its total breakdown of a public health system. And yet that effective economy, which doesn't go through uh, the mind or the superstructure but it's just, uh, you know, I, I'm the entrepreneur of my, myself. I accept total responsibility, which, which resonates in a way with some kind of pop existentialism. Uh, you know, how do you get, how do you even deal with that at all? You know, what, uh, how could, you can't tell per people, look, your chances are one in a million to do anything. You're, structurally, it's all against you unless, you know, who wants to hear that? And, uh, you know, how, how does a dose of reality here help, you know, and uh, it really is a, a conundrum, this, the, the strange non-death of neoliberalism, and, and, and who knows what we'll see afterwards, after all these uh, wonderful examples of how interdependent we are, and how collective labor really helps us to survive, and yet, and yet, and yet. So I hate to suggest maybe we're ending on, on that note. Uh, but more to say, this is, this is a conver conversation, uh, Mr. Spinoza, that we need to keep having as to why we invest in our servitude. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm going to go, I, I haven't seen The Lighthouse, Joe. I've seen The Witch, which I loved. Uh, absolutely incredible. So that, that's on my agenda too. And uh, I'm glad Bento could make his appearance in, the, in Jason's thing. So uh, uh, Jeremy, I'm, I'm disappointed that we didn't have a little of the guitar, but I'll, I'll let you go this time. I know we got you for another event. Uh, and Stephen, thanks a lot for, for your reflections. And uh, Bruno, excellent. So, okay, I, yeah, I got to do the, the money pitch one more time. So, uh, hey, uh, look in the descriptive box of uh, this event. You'll see something that says donate uh, and uh, click on it. And uh, let your conscience be your guide, as Jiminy Cricket says, uh, an old reference to an old movie. Uh, so th thanks for, oh, I also want to say that I made a mistake on the time of resource radicals with Theory of Franco's. It's 5 p.m. on Monday with uh, Theory of Franco's and Vanessa Frege. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you uh, throughout the rest of the month at Red May. Are we off the air?